thank you for flying up. I heard you were busy today. It was a fun day. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah, good, good. I, I, you'll explain Dynamic Island to me later. Uh, if, I don't understand. It's a great name. It feels like, a, 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 like it should be a reality show. Um, nonetheless, I want to focus on Steve uh, right now. Uh, obviously, these people need no introductions. This is Lorene um, and Johnny, <laughs> all well known for being such an important part of, of this journey. So let's start by looking at some clips of Steve Jobs here at Code at, and All Things D. Go ahead. Personal computer has been a pretty amazing thing in that it's morphed into these different things over the years. First it was a hobbyist tool, and then the age of productivity began, and that's what really fueled a lot of the growth. But then the internet came along. All of a sudden, the next great age of the personal computer started. We feel very strongly at Apple that there's a third great age of the personal computer coming. It's where the, the personal computer becomes sort of the, your digital hub. It's becoming the hub for your photography, your movies, your music, obviously. It's integral to our digital lifestyle. No plans at the current time to make a tablet. <laughs> I think the digital hub has been a resurgence of, of relevance for the PC. Our retail stores went from zero to a billion faster than anyone's ever done it before. Faster than really? Yeah. Are you losing money on those stores? No, we're making money. The third business we're about to get in is You're about to have a phone. About to have a right. phone. I have no idea. Oh, I'll send you one. Thanks. Best iPod we've ever made, by the way. Best phone we've ever made, too. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> we've really revolutionized how you use a cell phone. If it was nothing but a cell phone, it'd be really successful. It's the internet in your pocket for the first time. Generally, we were both the youngest guys in the room. And now, I'm the oldest guy in the room most of the time. And um, that's why I love being here. And <laughs> Steve is so known for his restraint. <laughs> I have one of the best jobs in the world. I'm incredibly lucky to hang around some of the most wonderful, brightest, committed people I've ever met in my life. And together, we get to play in the best sandbox I've ever seen and try to build great products for people. That's what keeps me going. And it's what kept me going five years ago. It's what kept me going 10 years ago when the doors were almost closed. And it's what will keep me going five years from now, whatever happens. You know, there's nothing that makes my day more than getting an email from some random person in the universe who just bought an iPad over in the UK and tells me the story about how it's the coolest product they've ever brought home, you know, in their lives. That's what keeps me going. Right, that was, I think, uh, <laughs> I think that was his last interview. I think it was just before he died. Um, so let's talk about the current moment. I would love each of you to reflect on how, uh, you can't guess what he was gonna think or anything else, but what Steve would think of the current moment in your estimation, again, we don't know, obviously. Um, Tim, why don't we start with you? The, the current moment at Apple or the current well, moment in the world? In the world at Apple. Oh, I think at Apple, uh, I believe and hope that he would be proud over a day like this where we bring out a lot of innovations that um, are very much on the principles that he laid out and articulated so well. Uh, I think the, the greater world he would be uh, troubled by a, a lot of things that he sees, the sort of the part, partisanship and, and the division in the world. And, and, uh, but I think he would be happy that we're living up to the values that he talked about so much, like privacy, uh, l like protecting the environment. Uh, these were, were core to him while we're keeping up innovation and, and uh, trying to give people something that uh, enables them to do something they couldn't do otherwise, to, to give them tools to, to discover their own self and to change the world in their own way. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, so I think it would be mixed. Uh, but I, and I hate to project right. kind of what he would think today. I really don't like to do that. Uh, but I, I, 
I think you know we there are lots of challenges in the world today. Mm -hmm. Marie, mm. um, it's true that this is this, that's an impossible hypothetical, but because we we knew him so very well for a long time, um, in in many ways he inhabits each of us, and for me, uh, a, often the way. I make sense of the world. I have sort of, you know, the resonance of his voice in my head often. Um, he would be very disappointed with the political climate, I would say. Um, not only the polarization, not only the fact that people are really um, coming to blows mm -hmm. you know, within families and communities in our country, but also just that he loved our country so much. He loved California so much, but he loved our country. He loved the idea of America. He loved what it allowed the individual and the communities to become. Um, he loved the unfetteredness of it. He, he loved the personal freedoms and liberties, but also the connectedness and responsibility for each other. It was very important to him to be able to give something back to the human experience. And I think he, he, would, be, he would not be quiet mm -hmm. about the <laughs> Would he current. be on Twitter? Would he be on Twitter? No. I, I mean, he wasn't a big fan of social media, um, <laughs> it, mainly because of the business model. Mm -hmm. um, but he would not be on Twitter. No, he would be speaking out easily mm -hmm. um, and often. Yeah. His Emails and letters were like tweets, though. They were short and kind of sweet. I remember when you uh, introduced uh, Ping. Uh, Ping? Ping? Ping. That was some social network. Um, yeah. You he, came out, really well. he came out of the room. You know, he comes out after he gives a speech in the room where people are looking at things. And he came out and he goes, what do you think? I said, I think it sucks. And he goes, oh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> right away. Um, and he goes, I hate social media which was interesting. And it wasn't because he wasn't social or anything like that. He just didn't, couldn't figure it out. Johnny, what do you think? Not on that particular uh, ping, because it, <laughs> it did suck, but go ahead. Um, certainly disappointed. I would actually, I, I don't know, I, I could imagine being, him being sort of mad slash furious, but also combined with, um, you know, that, that sort of compassion and love for the ideals that Lorene Lorene described. Um, I think both of those are fabulous fuels to be effective. Mm -hmm. And I think he would have bought his um, curiosity and lack of fear to, to have ideas. Um, but I, I think certainly would have felt that you know, there's an imperative here. Um, but you know, you know when he used to talk about it's important that you, f you, know, you find what it is you love. Mm -hmm. I used to think that was because you know, it's nice to film, feel warm in your tummy. Mm -hmm. He actually described that as being, you know, because it's, if you're going to do something that's really hard, mm. you need that sort of fuel. Mm -hmm. and, and fury and love, I think, are <laughs> wonderful fuels. And I would, I would expect they would be a mixture of both. So talk a little bit about the, one of the things that he did, and it got a lot of, it gets attention now and again, his quotes, and it was at a code, it was at a code conference, of, or an all things D conference, about privacy. That was something he talked about very clearly, plain English and everything else. Where do you think, this is something you've done at Apple a lot, it's been a big core value to the company, it's been good for market, people feel safer on it, um, it's good for sales. Talk a little bit about the issues around privacy now, how you're looking at yeah, you know, uh, Steve really ingrained in the company in the early days the importance of privacy. Mm -hmm. And it has only grown with every year that has passed since then. Mm -hmm. He saw in, I think it was uh, at D8 that he spoke about privacy here mm -hmm. in 2010, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he put it in such eloquent and simple terms. Mm -hmm. It means asking people's permission, mm -hmm. asking them repeatedly. And it has been at the heart of how we view privacy. And so, you know, we, we, we believe that privacy is a fundamental human right. 
and we see a world where privacy uh, takes a back seat and you have this sort of um, surveillance kind of mode everywhere, that this is a world where people begin to do less and think less. They begin to alter their behavior because they know they're being watched. Mm -hmm. And this is not a world that any of us want to, to live in. I think he saw that and saw that well. And I you know, have every reason to believe that uh, he would have uh, put up a, a good arguments and good fights al along the way. Which you have been attempting to do in lots of yes. ways, whether it's around advertising or anything else. Well, what, uh, what we felt is that people should own their data and they should make their own decision. And so what we believed is that people should be empowered to be able to make that decision in a really straightforward and simple manner, uh, not buried 95 pages deep in a privacy policy somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th that's the way that we've looked at it and we continue as each year goes by to try to give our users to empower them to make those decisions for themselves. And you, you see the features that we've rolled out over time that, that do that. We're, we are not trying to make the decision for them. Well, you have by de facto become, because of this, this core value of this company started by Steve, you've become the de facto regulator in that regard because regulators haven't stepped in. Yeah, we're not, we're not just trying to be a regulator, Kara. We're all, all we're trying to do is give people the ability to make the decision for themselves. Do they want to be tracked? Is this something that they're by freely making the decision to do? And so we're presenting them the ability to make that decision. And we, we just keep trying to do that more and more and more as time goes on. So Johnny, we were talking earlier about care, when we talked earlier this week about care and design. And that's another thing, because a lot of the stuff that's been rolled out that have been privacy violations have been rolled out without care. That's, you know, without, I think, without consequences, without intentionality, or just lack of caring about the consequences. Talk a little bit about the idea of care and design. I, I think in, I mean, Care is a t tough word in some ways to, to understand. I think it's easier to understand carelessness, mm -hmm. which is I see you know, it being a disregard for, for, for people. Um, you know, carelessness to me is just seeing people as a potential revenue stream, not the reason to work immoderately hard to really express your love and appreciation for the rest of the species. So for, 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 for us in our, our practice of design, I, I think care is, is very often felt and not, not necessarily seen. And I think, and I, I, I know it's something that I think the three of us feel strongly about, that that, that sort of care that, that is, I mean, Steve talked about, you know, the carpenter, the cabinet maker that would finish the back of the drawer. Mm -hmm. And it's that you, you're bothered beyond whether something is actually publicly seen. Mm -hmm. You do it not because there's a, uh, I don't know, an economic interest. Mm -hmm. You do it because it's the right moral decision. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think it's, I think particularly as a designer, I think it's very often in the very small, quiet things, like worrying about how you package a cable mm -hmm. or, or, or You clearly or worry about that a lot. Yeah. I worry about that ever such a lot. <laughs> And, and, and Steve worried about that a, a mm -hmm. lot as well. And I think, um, I think it's that sort of, that preoccupation. You know, when you're sat there on a Sunday afternoon worrying about the, the power cable that's packaged as a, a ziggy zag thing, and you're gonna take that little wire tie off. When you're sat there on a Sunday afternoon worrying about this isn't really very good. The only reason, I think you're very aware that the reason you are there is because I think our species deserves better. Mm -hmm. It deserves some thought. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lovely way of, of, I don't know, I think you feel connected. Right. I remember once Walt came back from visiting him when, when they made, uh, when uh, Microsoft made their, what was it, the Zune? Zune. The Zune. The Zune. Yeah. yeah. I I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a Microsoft version of the iPod, really. Mm -hmm. And apparently, Walt, he, he, Steve had not seen it, and Walt handed it to him, and this is what he did. Walt handed it to him, and he went like this. <laughs> Very dramatic. 
very Steve. He goes, I cannot touch that. That is disgusting, um, essentially. Um, you know, he was doing it for Walt's benefit, but he was repulsed by the design. He was repulsed by the, of what it was, whether it worked or not, I don't care. Let me talk about this, this idea of care around creation, because you, you're doing a whole lot of different things now, um, but the idea of, uh, that seemed to be something that mattered, and some people thought it was niggling details, fastidiousness, whatever it was. How do you look at that? Um, I think that Steve, early on in his life, developed out a very full aesthetic sense. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, certainly before um, I did, and and he noticed details of everything, the way that the floor meets the walls, meets the ceilings, the way that, that the lights um, are either recessed or not recessed, whether or not the, the sconce design allows for the kind of illumination that it's meant for, all things like that. He was very, very much aware of, of both the physical and the natural environment. Mm -hmm. um, he was animated by the natural environment as well. And I think, um, as I mentioned, he loved California. He, he really loved California. He loved the natural beauty and the light of it and um, the sense of openness and possibility. And I think that that allowed him to have a much broader sense of, of what his life could be mm -hmm. as well. Um, I think that, you know, people, people made fun of us for years because in our house we couldn't agree on a sofa or chairs. So <laughs> for many, many years we had neither. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but, but mainly because um, we, we really, you know, there were so many details that we had to agree on. Yeah. Um, and we, we finally did. Yeah, um, but it, I think it took about eight years. Oh, wow. <laughs> it wasn't just a thing. I don't like couches. Because there's a lot of pictures of him without couches. A lot of, if yeah, I Yeah, but that was a, that's that, why. Okay. That was a real thing. So one of the things was the idea of what, how to wield power, Tim. And under your leadership, since uh, you took over, Apple is enorm has become enormous. Um, it was a much smaller company when Steve, uh, when Steve was running it. How do you look at that idea? Because you know, one of the things that Apple's undergoing now, is all of tech is undergoing is scrutiny around power, about the power that these companies have over people. Um, I'd love you to sort of reflect on the idea of what the, the concepts were at the beginning, because one of the things Steve did was push against power, that famous ad, obviously. Um, and he talked about it a lot, uh, the idea of, of, he didn't seem to like power, but now this is, probably the most powerful company in tech, or one of them. You know, we don't think in those terms. Okay. That's not how we think. We, we think about um, our values, and we, we think about uh, using any platform that we might have to expand those values. And so we, we just talked about privacy, but environment is another one. Mm -hmm. You know, we touch a lot of companies around the world uh, because we manufacture things. And we know that we have a responsibility to, to convince those companies to use renewable energy and to recycle and, and to do things that are in, sustainable. Um, so that's the lens that we look at it through, not, not the lens of power and, and wielding it. I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, the company is still run the way Steve set it up. How it's would still, you describe that? It's still a functional-based company. You know, we don't have uh, these many p and Ls in the in that where people fight about what costs are allocated to which p and L and those sorts of things. We have one for the company, mm -hmm. and we have someone that owns software and someone that owns hardware and someone that owns technology and someone that owns design, and there it's a. It's a great partnership and collaboration. Uh, and it was something that he demanded of people, was, was this idea of collaboration and the idea that small teams could do incredible things together. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, you know, he, he ran a meeting every Monday, Johnny will remember this well, at nine o'clock. Oh. And no matter where you were, you were in that meeting at nine o'clock on Monday. And this it is would, in? He would get the top people of the company together Cupertino. and we'd go through everything in the company that was key. We still run that same meeting on that same day at that same time. Mm -hmm. And so a, a lot of the things that he brought uh, that aren't talked about very much, uh, they, they live on mm -hmm. the, in terms of the principles and, and so forth that, that he utilized. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't sit around and say, what would Steve do? He told us not to do that. Right. But the reality is that he was uh, the best teacher I've ever had by far. And, and those teachings live on, and not just in me, because it's in a whole uh, bunch of people that, mm -hmm. that are there. So give me a few of those teaching from your perspective. What was well, most he, he, was always a, he was always on that Apple should make the best products, mm -hmm. not the most. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. And so that looking at things from that lens changes everything, mm -hmm. right? And, and in reality, and sometimes those two align and the best is the most, mm -hmm. but many times it doesn't. And many times it won't because, right. the, because uh, products become commoditized over time in, in certain uh, fields like the personal computer business that really happened to. Mm -hmm. and, and we've never set a goal to make the most personal computers. Mm -hmm. We make the Mac and we, we, love, we love what the Mac does and, and, and it's the best. So we can be proud that it's the best. Uh, he, he had a uh, view that he really uh, drilled in me that Apple should own its primary technologies. Mm -hmm. And th that thinking led us to uh, go into the processor business for the Mac. Mm -hmm. You know, first, first on the iPhone. And, right, which and means then on not the, buy Intel chips. Or it, whatever it, it, right, it, it did mean that. Uh, because it's a, a very core technology. Uh, you know, he believed that you should own the customer experience in, the t in total. Mm -hmm. And that uh, the way that a customer felt drove him significantly. He wanted to delight people. He, you heard on the video, and in, this happened thousands of times, where he would get notes from somebody mm -hmm. that he doesn't know and they would talk about using, getting our product and finding out that it did X and Y that they didn't even know that it did. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was years after they had initially bought the product. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these are still uh, you know, deeply embedded in, into the company. But talk about most, one of you talked about the Nano. Was it the Nano? Or the, the Nano. The, 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 he, yeah. That became big, right? That be, Very he was big. surprised, correct? Ian, uh, I, I remember we, we I know we were chatting about this, but uh, uh, over lunch, um, I, I can't remember which generation of the Nano it was, but the, uh, he was so surprised to be directly touching people. Um, I mean, I, I, I was so struck that he'd always assumed vicariously um, his work, Apple's work, would have enormous influence. Mm -hmm. But this was suddenly the, the volumes um, uh, of, of this product, the fact that it was literally um, directly touching people, um, thrilled him. Not, not because of, you know, the, exactly as Tim described, not because that, that was a goal, huge volume, but to be so relevant with something that we'd poured so much care into. Mm -hmm. So the idea what, that, but he still liked that it was not just impactful, but the good business, presumably. Um, we never talked about the business stuff. <laughs> never? Um, not really. <laughs> what did you talk about? I told you, like, hanking cables. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I was, um, I don't know, I, uh, we, we talked about a, a lot of stuff that was really about how we, we saw the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought the way Actually, it was interesting seeing that clip of, of you know, Bill and Steve when Bill said that he was, he was jealous of Steve's taste. He was. And I don't think that meant Bill was jealous of the way Steve chose his sneakers. No. I think it was that, that there was something beautiful about the way that Steve thought. 
and about the way he perceived things and the way he saw the world. Um, and I, I think there was, you know, Lorena and I were chatting about this, there was such intention in Steve's thinking, wasn't there? You know, there was such rigor. Um, and, you know, I've never met somebody so curious and so inquisitive. Mm -hmm. You know, it, his curiosity wasn't, you know, casual or passive. It was ferocious. Mm -hmm. um, it was restless, but it was intentional. Mm -hmm. And right. Talk about that. You just were nodding. Oh, I, I was thinking about um, actually when Steve came back to Apple and Tim would probably know how many product lines there actually were oh and how many products there were um, in the 30s or 40s. And um, so... Too it, many, in other words. Too many product lines. Yeah. Way too many. So many. And, and they were, of course, um, running out of money. And he clarified went around and talked to everyone and then clarified and justified the product line to, to be a two by two matrix and narrowed it down to four things. Now, that, that meant he had to use incredibly disciplined decision making and focus, um, but he also was very much driven by keeping the company in business. Mm -hmm. um, so he, at that point, he was very concerned about the business and used that very much as a yardstick. Uh, and I think that something else that, that Steve often talked about was, um, was the power of saying no. Not no to bad ideas, but no to great ideas. Mm -hmm. No to ideas that you desperately wish to follow through on, but they actually don't fit in that. That's that what Evan was just talking about, some of his ideas. He can't do them for various reasons, to find the discipline in them. Um, to keep going with that, that idea, the idea that you just don't do them. No, no, no. So that's, that, that speaks to sort of his, the clarity of his thinking and the crispness of his thinking, as well as his desire to make those four things the best on the planet because he, oh. he often talked about leaving behind a body of work, mm -hmm. the way that an artist does. Right. Um, and so he would, when you want to have a body of work, you want it to be great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk about that idea of creativity. One of the things he talked about a lot when we talked was about um, mixing the art and the commerce and the technology, which I think has been lost rather significantly. Um, I'd love it from, from your perspective, Tim, when you think about what you're making now, do you think, how hard is it to, to marry those things without the person who talked about them all the time? I think, you know, Steve's uh, vision for Apple was always to stand at the intersection of the liberal arts and technology, mm -hmm. was to always be there. And we've, we've always tried to stay in that spot and always think about the humanity, sort of the person behind the product, the person that's using the product, and have the technology kind of recede into the background. Um, and, and time and time again, he showed that he was doing that. And he would make bold decisions on fo focus, as witnessed by, I, th I think he even shared on uh, one of these, these stages, that he initially was going to work on a tablet mm -hmm. when he saw multi-touch and decided, no, this, this could be a, a phone. Mm -hmm. And the phone was more important than the tablet. And so right. he took what then he made was a arguably a great idea yeah. and shelved it mm -hmm. for years. Mm -hmm. This was not a, you know, let's delay it a couple weeks or a year or something. Mm -hmm. This was multiple years. Mm -hmm. uh, and iPad, as you know, has, has it's, people love the product. Mm -hmm. So delaying it to the phone. He did lie about the phone on stage to us, absolutely directly, and then did laughed he? about it the next year. And we go, did you lie to us? He goes, I did. I think, I I think initially, he, he, Steve was very concerned that um, Apple could not control the product. Yes, the orifice thing. In, in a way that would make it the best product. He was worried that the carriers had uh, would direct the design of the product. Mm -hmm. 
And it, so he was very worried that that would wind up being a yes. you know, product that Apple should not be doing. And so it was not until he saw a way to change that mm -hmm. that he became a huge proponent of, of Apple in the phone business. Mm -hmm. he, he did on stage at, at Alden Z, he said, I don't like crawling through orifices, <laughs> which we were like, lovely. That's, that's yeah, funny. I was just wording it a little differently. Yeah, right. Well, that was, he was talking about phone companies. And, <laughs> and that's why you saw that picture of Walt and I going through the orifice. Um, but one of the things that was interesting about it was getting control of that. You know, getting control of whether Bob Iger talked about that, getting control of content, getting control of things that had been in, in powerful positions that prevented you from making things at that time, as I recall. Um, when you think about that, Johnny, in the, one of the things was design, the freedom of design. Um, how do you look at current design right now uh, of things compared to what you were making? I know you're working on a range of things. You can't talk about everything you're making. Um, but how do you look at what's happened to design? Um, that's a curious, I mean, I, I, I think we're so sort of preoccupied with what we're wrestling with um, that that's fairly sort of all-consuming. All mm -hmm. um, I, th I think the, the, the problems, the challenges are, you know, remain the same. Um, I, I do think that there are, I mean, there are fabulous um, affordances um, with interfaces like, for example, multi-touch. Mm -hmm. But we do remain physical beings, and mm -hmm. I do think that there are opportunities, and sometimes I think potentially the pendulum may swing a little to have interfaces and products that are more, more tactile and more engaging physically. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there are hu I mean, the winds are substantial to have the ability to have a, a, an interface that is app specific. Mm -hmm. um, but there, I think there are um, examples where um, the interface is being driven by, uh, inappropriately by something like uh, multi-touch. Like cars. For example. Yeah. What would a car you design look like? You know I can't talk to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> I I could ask the same. What would a, what would a car you would? Design? Oh yeah, that's a good question for me. <laughs> um, I'm not a car person, really. Uh, so I, I I love I love beautiful old ones that are no longer yeah. safe to drive. So I find most I'll electric just, cars soulless. I find them soulless. Yeah, that's why I'll, I can't buy one yet. I would say I know you I know you guys um, don't love the design of Tesla, but. I appreciate its the degree of its safety. Mm -hmm. It's really quite nice. But I was saying I, I would like to come back to your previous question, if I may, Kara, because I think that something that that Steve always uh, took great pride in was have being surrounded by artists and poets and musicians, mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with design. So you design who you're with. And you find you find diversity of thought, and um, mm -hmm. and it brings out mm -hmm. something different in you. And it's what Tim was talking about. You know, really residing in that intersection of liberal arts mm -hmm. or humanities and technology. And I think that so, you know Silicon Valley has always been a place where people people came with big ideas and mm -hmm. wanted to come and do great things. And, and I hope that they're still remembering mm. that it, we actually need some, some poetry and romance I don't in, think so. in what comes out of there. And I, no, I think that it's less, much less than it used to be. Well, he's, he's, he's re, I think his understanding and reverence for the creative process was extraordinary. I mean, I think Tim and I learned so much um, just, just going through the process with, with Steve. But I think the, the way the process tended to work was there was thinking, which is why the in, being intentional about your thinking, being very self-aware, but from, from, from your thinking, ideas emerge. And I think the one thing that, I mean, Tim and I talked about so much was the nature of ideas. Ideas are fragile. They're not resolved. If they were resolved, they wouldn't be ideas, they'd be products. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that happens, and I think one of the huge challenges, particularly amongst large groups, is that when you're talking about an idea, often the thing that is easiest to talk about, that is measurable, that's tangible, are the problems. Mm -hmm. And he was masterful at, at helping people um, uh, not, of course, not ignore the problems, but to remain focused upon the promise, the vision of the actual idea. And there was that, a, a wonderful reverence, I think, that he had for the creative process. Mm -hmm. and, and I think most artists and designers, um, even if it's self-preservation, I mean, if you're being expected to produce an idea and you know that ideas don't oblige, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you can't predict when you're gonna have a good idea, I think you, you tend to need to focus on process and the discipline of sure. trying to increase the probability of a good idea. Mm. You know, as I was thinking about this, one of the things that I, I have felt over the many years is that, um, you know, Steve was not an easy subject. He, he had a lot of edges to him. Um, but he was, it was more around passion and it was yeah. more around being difficult for a good reason, for, you know, he see, sometimes, I mean, he looks so calm in comparison to today's moguls. He's just like, he'd park his car somewhere weird, and that was the biggest controversy of the moment. You know, he didn't like tweet penis jokes at the president or something like that. Um, so, it, so what, he drove his car, and I don't care at this point. It seems very um, benign, all the, kind of the, some of the stuff he was doing. But one of the things I, I was thinking is this idea of you were talking about which why you're making something to be beautiful for ideas it's been replaced by a, a rapaciousness it just has it just it you it, there's there's no beauty in it it's soulless and it feels um it doesn't feel soaring how do you think about that tim like in terms of keeping that there because there is the pressure pressure for earnings there's a pressure for things and you and i talked about that in one of our interviews when I, and I'm, you want to talk about specific people, we were talking about Mark Zuckerberg at that time, and I said, what would you have done? And you said, I wouldn't be in this place in the first place. Broader than that, how did we get in this place in the first place? Because I do think the death of Steve Jobs sort of changed something in, in the atmosphere, and people that rose up, you know, for all his flaws, were not up to his speed. I don't, maybe you don't agree with me and on that. I think Silicon Valley's not monolithic. No. And so it's not monolithic, and so I think it's hard to paint everything with one roller. And... Although people revered him more than anybody, as a. Oh, I revere him, <laughs> as, as you know. Yeah. And uh, and and so I, I think, he's a measuring stick, that when you compare most people to, are always going to fall short of. And. And that's great. He was a one in a century plus kind of person, I think, and in, in most every way. And he was also demanding, and he was passionate about his point, and he believed that uh, you get a better answer by debating. And so a, a lot of what uh, people might not understand about him was he would debate just to get the subject going, sometimes taking a position that he didn't even believe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just to get the discussion going because he was so convinced if you examine this thing from outside and in a deep kind of way, in a very thoughtful kind of way, you would arrive at a better decision. Mm -hmm. And I think, yes, I think that's something that uh, not just founders, but everyone can learn from. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I think getting, uh, having the learnings from, from him moving forward is something that is, is very important. Mm -hmm. Because I, I do think that he was a one, a one in a gazillion kind of thing. And uh, it, it certainly from my point of view, he changed the trajectory of my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't imagine learning from anyone else the amount that I learned from him. You know, it was, it was just, and it was a daily kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, he demanded innovation everywhere. Obviously, he demanded in products. 
but he demanded that marketing be innovative. He demanded that operations be innovative. He wanted every single thing in the company to be the best. And he had the examination ability with his thinking to go very deep on almost everything mm -hmm. in the company. It was a very unusual mm -hmm. skill set that, that, that he had. And so I think we can all learn from that mm -hmm. in, in our own lives, both personal lives and in, in, in business. Well, in the debating thing is interesting because I do think one of the things, someone was asking me what the problem is, and I'm like, they're surrounded by people who get, they pay, they own, and they don't have anyone disagreeing with them. There's no disagreement, there's no right. debate. Uh, everyone is in violent agreement together, and, and then they feel victimized as a group. Yes, you know. mm -hmm. where there was always debate with him. Mm -hmm. There was I'd always imagine. debate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know there was a, a folklore that you didn't debate him. That's not true. In fact, if you didn't debate him, he would kind of mow you down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he just, he did not work well with those kind of folks that would not feel comfortable in debating and pushing back. And, and, uh, and it, it was a very different environment for me. Mm -hmm because I came out of an environment that was more hierarchical in nature, and you sort of, each person agreed with the higher level person before you entered a room, and there was no debate and no discussion. Mm -hmm. And What was the, your greatest debate with him over? Probably the way the initial iPhone was sold. What did you, what was your side? Uh, I was for, putting it in the subsidy model. And he was for the rev share. And, and his way was more creative and more different. My way would have scaled faster. I, at least I, I felt strongly. And so we were in quite a discussion about this uh, for, for a while. For, it was a, it was a multi-year dis discussion. <laughs> okay. What about you, Lorraine? What was yours, what was the debate you would have as partners? What was with the Steve? debate yeah. I would have yeah. with Steve? The, besides the couch, I mean, No, no, it, I mean, we were, we were together for 22 years, mm -hmm. so we, <laughs> pick your month and we we it. <laughs> So I want to finish up um, talking a little bit about um, some things you're going to do. Would you want to talk about the archive or not, or the? Oh yes. Go ahead. Yes. Um, so what what Kara's alluding to is um, a, a group of us, the the three of us, and and others who worked with Steve um, over the years came together as advisors, and we have um, a lead historian and archivist in a small group that has established the Steve Jobs Archive. And um, while we do have some, some artifacts and some actual real material, the, the archive is much more about ideas, um, as Johnny was describing, and um, really rooted in Steve's long-held notion that once you understand that outside of the natural world, everything in, in the built environment and all the systems that govern our life on the planet were built and designed by other humans. And once you have that insight, you understand that you as a human can, can change it, can prod it, can perhaps interrogate it and, and stretch it. And in that way, human progress happens. And so he would reference the fact that um, everything that you're born into, uh, the design of everything around you, the clothes that you wear, all of these decisions were made by someone else um, and the actual artifacts were made by someone else. And so as humans, we have a responsibility to, to put things back into that pool of human existence in a way that benefits all and that moves things forward. And that, and, but thereby we have human progress. So what is in the archive, this idea of? So we have, well, the archive will, has a, has a website, Steve Jobs Archive, and then, then there will be some programs that we have. Um, there'll be other products that I won't speak about at the moment. 
Um, there's a lot of, over the years, very carefully, um, a very brilliant documentary uh, filmmaker has interviewed hundreds of people who have reminiscence, uh, memories, experiences, um, really beautiful stories to tell about Steve and working with Steve, and so uh, we've collected that as well. There's also a lovely body uh, of stuff that's just Steve, that mm -hmm. it's not somebody's um, interpretation of. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we thought was so powerful about that was that you actually started to get a sense of how he did see the world. Um, and, and it's not somebody trying to make sense of something he said or a way he behaved. Mm -hmm. You get to see, you know, a little note that he scratched or a right. way he annotated a, um, an email or a presentation. Mm -hmm. But when you see something directly, you start to get a sense of, of what he was thinking and why. And you realize how much he's lost, don't you? Mm -hmm. when you're trying, you know, when somebody else tries to make sense of someone's behavior. Mm -hmm. So what would he be doing now? My last question. We have a, we have a Zoom question from someone I know. Um, what, and we have some questions from the audience. Um, what would he be doing now if he had lived? What do you imagine he'd be working on? Just guess. Oh, I wouldn't want to guess. I think Steve was constantly changing. And, and so he wasn't static. He would take a firmly held belief and present it with new facts, would change like this. It was one of the great things I admired about him. Uh, he would be dogmatic about something, presented something else like this, change. And I, th I think that is such a great characteristic of people because people get held back by their old thinking. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what new thoughts and ideas come up, and, and he never did. And so, um, you know, I, I knew what he was thinking in 2010 and 2011 and, and before, but what he would be thinking about today, I, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess. No, he would be evolving. Mm -hmm. um, he also was quite mindful about having, not staying too long at the helm and, mm -hmm. and making space for others. Um, he did have a fantasy of teaching eventually. Oh. Wow. And because we live right near Stanford, you know, that notion of riding the bike to Stanford and teaching classes there. Professor was Steve very... Jobs? Yes, exactly. <laughs> what did he want to teach? Oh, well, I mean, I think he could teach almost anything and people mm. would, would really benefit from it. <laughs> <laughs> Not driving. Go ahead. <laughs> Actually, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I, I, I think part of curiosity, which I, I think defines so much of, 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 of Steve, is, is your appetite to learn. And to learn is more important than being right. Mm -hmm. I think that goes to what Tim was saying, which is, you know, you, you can present with passion a perspective or a point of view, but you're doing that not to win an argument, you're doing it just to try and understand. And, and I think there's something so pure about that appetite just to learn, because it makes you question the motivation, and the motivation not to win arguments, the motivation is to be able to do better work. Mm -hmm. And I always loved how clear he was, I mean, a, a, about, you know, a bunch of stuff can be consequential to doing better work, like disruption. Mm -hmm. Disruption was never one of our goals, was it? Right. It happened to be a consequence of just trying to do something better. But not a goal. But not a goal. Or a company motto, for example. <laughs> Stuff like that. All right, we have a question from Zoom. First, go. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi, Walt. Hi. So, <clears throat> you know, I spent, for a journalist, for an outsider, I spent many, many hours talking to him. We would have half an hour interview schedule that would wind up being two and a half hours and would go far beyond whatever uh, he wanted to show me or whatever I wanted to ask him, covering a lot of the fields that you're talking about beyond just what Apple was doing. But one thing he never mentioned in any of his talks with me was the stock market, was market cap, was the stock price. 
Now, in the early days, as, as Lorene mentioned, he did care about, you know, the revenues and the profits of the company because it was almost dead. Mm -hmm. But once the company got on a kind of steady uh, uh, footing financially, um, uh, my impression was, yes, he cared about the company doing well, but he did not care about what the stock market thought. At least I, I couldn't discern that at, at all. And as you know, he also didn't even appear on most of the earnings calls. So, and, and to me, the, the whole tech industry is like caught up in, this, in what the stock, what Wall Street thinks. So can you talk about that? Am I wrong or uh, am I missing something? And would he be as frenetic about the price of the stock and your two and a half trillion dollar market cap as uh, some other people are, journalists and other people who write about it, analysts? I think it would be unimportant to him, Walt. I would agree with you completely. He was not driven by the financial results. He was driven by making the best products that really enriched people's lives. And so he was about changing the world. Mm -hmm. And, and that is really not, not marketing speak, that is what drove him. Uh, and he, he saw the, the success of the company merely the, the result of doing the other things right. And so he was never confused about uh, focusing on the indirect consequence, on the, the, on the market and the, the financial results. He focused on the inputs getting the products right, making sure they were the best, uh, making sure they were making a difference in people's lives. Thank you, Walt. All right, I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Thank Tara. you. By the nice. way, Walt, Mossberg and I did it together. So everybody give a clap for Walt Mossberg. <laughs> okay, we really have some questions. If they are all about the new iPhone, I'm going to make you move on because I want to talk about Steve Jobs, if you don't mind. If it's my conference, and so there you have it. And, um, but you can, but oh, for fuck's sake. Um, so, so we'll ask some questions, and then we'll go. And I have something I want to, last thing I want to read. So, Neela, and all of them short, please. Go. Yes. Don't worry, I was there this morning. I don't have any okay. questions about the iPhone. They wouldn't let me on your plane, Tim. Um, you guys talked a lot about how Steve would think the current political climate was really divisive, uh, that social media was bad. At the end of the day, those apps run on your phone. Those apps are why the, the smartphones are popular. How, would you, how do you think Steve would have felt about the phone itself enabling some of these applications, and would he have wanted to take more control of that interaction? I think, uh, well, I don't want to forecast what Steve would have thought in, in 2022. But what, what we felt along the way is that, that some people were using the phone too much. And we never put, put out the phone for somebody to endlessly, mindlessly scroll in a, in a feed. And, and so we created things like screen time to try to help people know what they were doing. And with the thinking that if people knew that people were really smart, that they would alter their behavior. And we've seen some of that. Uh, so I, I suspect he, when he started parental controls back before it, anyone was talking about parental controls, and I, I suspect that he would be, uh, you know, thinking about more of those mm -hmm. of those things. Are you as are you as worried about are you as worried about TikTok as everyone else at this conference? <laughs> You know, I don't feel like a TikTok expert, <laughs> and, and uh, so I would, uh, you know, let other uh, other folks talk about that. One. You don't seem like a TikTok expert, um, <laughs> although I do enjoy your air fryer content, Tim. It's really fun to watch. Um, when you think about design in that same vein, do you worry about how it's used? When do you think about the intentionality of design? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you're innovating, there will always be unintended consequences. Some of them um, wonderful and some of them not wonderful. And, and I think the issue is, is just how, you know, your, your decision in terms of what responsibility you need to shoulder. I think the more powerful, I mean, there's wonderful historic um, precedent for powerful tools 
um, having that, you know, that um, ability to be used in both ways. Um, but I think it, it's, you know, the consequences, uh, in the end of the day, I, I, th I think it comes down to how you view your responsibility. Okay, Ina? Uh, Ina Fried with Axios. Um, this is a question I've actually wanted to ask uh, several of you for a long time. We've talked, we've alluded to Steve's more challenging qual personality qualities. I'm curious which of his uh, hard edges you think served him and which were the ones that kind of got in his way sometimes? Ooh, Marine, you get that one. Um, there were a lot of qualities that served him uh, because he was you know, an extraordinary leader, and he had, as we were saying, um, confidence in his his own abilities to see and understand, but also something in it that, that Tim mentioned is Steve actually called other people all the time, every day. He had a list of people he called, and he just would ask them, what's going on, what are you seeing, what are you thinking about, what are you watching? But, and he would, he would go across industry and, and call people who, of course, would answer the phone. And he would just, you know, pick people's brains constantly, which was a really interesting um, and, and I think uh, not widely spoken about trait of his. And I think it made him, it, it, it reminded him to keep a beginner's mind and it reminded him that that these ideas exist um, and are held by very, very smart people. Um, I think, you know, there were times, however, when he would, to his detriment, perhaps feel so confident in a point of view that, uh, this is the corollary, that he actually um, didn't necessarily interrogate it in a way that, that he might have. But it, it also played to his benefit. I think there was one, there's, there's one thing that really struck me was that if you think of you know, the behavior or the characteristics of somebody who is so curious and questioning, and then you try and think of the, the characteristics of a person that has, the, that has the required resolve and focus to turn an idea despite all the problems, despite all of the, ba the barriers, to turn that idea into something, something real. And then along that way, when you come against a problem, you can't just stamp your foot. You have to go back and, and exercise those muscles of curiosity again. And I think one of the things that's perhaps not obvious is that doesn't happen just once or twice in a program. It happens once or twice every morning. And, and I think that sometimes if you don't have that sense of context, it could look like antisocial behavior. <laughs> Good question. Over here, and we'll get here. Thank you. Hi, uh, Zia Yusuf. Thank you all for, for these amazing insights. I um, wanted to ask you about the role of spirituality in Steve's journey, uh, and the focus on simplicity, the curiosity, the design aesthetic. Did that play a role? Is that also driven, Johnny, for you and others around design? Any thoughts on that? And I don't mean religion. I, I just truly mean spirituality from there. I, I think it's, very, it's, it's tough to have a conversation about beauty without being sort of very humble and aware that there's, there's an awful lot more going on <laughs> than, than we can easily articulate or see or, or take a photograph of. Um, and so I, I think that, again, those are those wonderfully um, unusual juxtapositions of conversations that are um, maybe be perceived as esoteric and ethereal right next to, well, what, what does the wall thickness need to be here so we can cool this properly? And I think those are lovely conversations to have, um, you know, at, at, at the same time. I would say he was spiritual. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I think, you know, when he was young, uh, 19 or 20, he dropped out of college and he went to India. Yep. Um, and that was, that was a spiritual exploration that he had and then and came back and studied Zen Buddhism um, and for many, many years had a teacher that he would sit zazen with and, and study with. 
Um, and that was, that was in the early, early days, obviously, of Apple, but I think it absolutely shaped his sense of his, his place in the universe as, as an individual being. And also it helped shape his sense of time. And, and I think he, he, had, he had a very um, sophisticated notion, not only that, that our, our time, all of our time, is quite brief in the uh, context of the rest of the natural world, but also the, the way to, to use your time in a very wise and, um, and deliberate manner. Okay, uh, right here. Good evening, beautiful people. My name is Laquan. Um, so uh, we talked about connectivity uh, being very vital to uh, what Steve saw. Um, and I think a big aspect of connectivity is communication. Um, and communication was revolutionized with the iMessage, right? Um, how do you think Steve would feel currently about the state of communication, specifically between people who aren't within the community of Apple and are part of the iMessage, um, but uh, more so on the green side of things with uh, Android. We've seen a massive divide there. Um, so how, would, how do you think Steve would feel about adapting RCS, rich communication systems, that would normalize and streamline that? Yeah. Tim, can you bring peace to the phone wars? <laughs> he always uh, told me not to, to wonder what he would have uh, thought just to do the right thing. Uh, I don't hear our, our users asking that, that we put a lot of energy in on that at this point. <laughs> and so, now I would Both love to- continue. I would love to convert you to uh, iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's just, it's, a, it's tough, uh, not to make it personal, but I can't send my mom certain videos or she can't send me certain videos. And so we leave- Buy your mom an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to as many questions. Thank you. Go right up here. <laughs> no, uh, right here, and then we'll go here. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, you said like privacy is a human right. Um, it's also monetizable. Uh, like, you've rolled out a lot of features. Uh, app tracking transparency uh, is probably the big one. It improved privacy. Also hobbled some of your competitors. Uh, they've been very vocal about that. I don't have to list who they are. Uh, you're also reportedly building up your own app network. Um, so it's obvious how that would help Apple. How does that help your users, and is that still consistent with Steve's vision for privacy? Well, we, we started advertising back in 2009 or 2010 with iAd. Mm -hmm. yep. And then it morphed into search ads and so forth. But we follow the, the same rules or, in fact, more stringent rules on privacy than we, uh, than we put others up to. And, and so the digital advertising is not a bad thing. We've never said digital advertising is a bad thing. What, what is not good is vacuuming up people's data when they're, when it's not, when they're not doing so on an informed basis. That's what, that's what is bad. And so we're, we try to put the user in the driver's seat there to own their data. Okay, right here. Hi, how's everybody doing? Uh, first things first, I'm glad to actually see you guys in person. <laughs> it's like the people who pretty much govern my life. Okay. <laughs> so, They're real. Um, they are. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to And um, <laughs> I wrote down this question because I've been thinking about this just in regards to my business and what I want. So for you guys, to me, you guys are like the Nike of technology and products. Same way to me, I see Nike as the apple of shoes and apparel. So it's like, for me, I wanna know, how do you gain that monopolization over your market? And how do you keep that grasp over your market and never let it go? Because I know it's a journey, I know it's a struggle, I know it's a fight, but you guys have competitors, but we don't see your competitors. Right. We, see, we see you. So it's like, how do we get that grasp of the market if we're looking to change in our business? We actually have fierce competitors. We're in the uh, <laughs> most competitive industry there probably is, the smartphone market. Uh, you know, we're, we're not the market leader in terms of market share. Mm. Samsung is. 
And if you watch football or any other thing on your, on your weekend, you will see their ads everywhere. And so there's a, and of course there's lots of other people in the smartphone business as well, including Google and uh, Huawei and Oppo and Vivo and Xiaomi. And so all of these folks are spending tons of money around the world. What, what we do is we just try to very simply tell our product story say what we're about. And we, we try to make it as simple a message as possible because there's a limit to the messages that you can get across in th a 30 second ad or even a one minute ad. Right. And, and so you'll see us occasionally highlight uh, maybe photography and the, the, the beauty of the photos that you, that you can take. Maybe we Another time we might focus on video, and so we may take one feature and really highlight it in a, in a, in a great way. Um, maybe we highlight privacy, uh, and maybe we highlight the um, ability of the iPhone to withstand drops and, and so forth in certain cases. And, and so just make it very simple is, the, is, our, is our message. Okay, and you say you guys have fierce competitors. But if I were to ask everybody in here to ask, who in here has an iPhone or an, I or an Apple product? This is what I mean by you, you guys have the monopoly. You guys? No, <laughs> no, the facts don't bear you out. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. All right. Thank you. Yep. All right, thank you. We don't have time for more questions. Um, I'm sorry, apologies. Um, sorry, Steve, and you get to talk to them plenty. Um, and same thing with you, Lauren. Um, so. I, I'm going to indulge you. I, I would one, one more question, final question, and thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. One word for Steve Jobs, if you had to say, I know there's so many words, but one word, and I have one, and I'm going to finish up on that. One word. Curiosity. Mm. Oh, go ahead, Larry. I don't know. I'm still thinking. Johnny? That's an impossible question, isn't it? Yes. He, yeah. And he wouldn't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Radiant. That's a great one. Uh, I would say pure. Nice. See, you could yeah. think of something. See? Yeah, I just um, I'm going to say surprising. And I'm going to yeah. tell one Steve Jobs story, which took place at Code. Um, we were in the back, and Walt was, he had just come off and he had met, um, I think, Louis for the first time when he was, uh, maybe at Louis or Alex. And he started asking me intense questions about how we had them, da 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 da, da like a lot. And he never did that. Like, he was always interested in Walt. I was like the girl standing next to Walt most of the time for him, because he, he and Walt had a very interesting mm -hmm. relationship. Um, <laughs> but. He was really interested, he asked tons and tons of questions, and it was because he himself had been adopted. And he asked about adoption and this and that, and I said, well, I had the baby because I have a uterus and it's great. And so, but we're doing this adoption and that, and there were lots of adoption problems at the time for gay people. And he told me his whole story sitting there. It was, it, it, it was amazing, which has been reported. It wasn't quite the same as it's been reported, but it was when he, he told the story about the doctor and his parents and this and that. And one of the things he did was say, um, you're not who you were born to, you know, because of, I was like, oh, I consider Alex, it must have been Alex. I consider him my kid. I consider, I didn't have him, but he's my kid. I adopted him. And he said, oh, it's not who you're born to. And uh, I, he, he talked about his, his adopted parents, how much he loved them. Um, he was crying. He made me cry. Um, I think of, when I think about it, I cry about it. And he went on and talked about it. And he said, just remember, it doesn't matter where you came from. Like, it's who you are and the people who love you. And it was, uh, mm. I was surprised. And that's what I would say about him. He was surprising as a person. And I had thought he was a very different, kind of not like that. And it was really quite a moment. And then, of all things, he hugged me, um, which I don't <laughs> like. Um, but he did. And it was really, I just couldn't believe it. I was sort of like, all right, I'll hug some jobs. Um, but w the reason why I want to read the last thing from his, and this may make me cry, I read it every three months. Um, and this is why we do the things we do. Remember, or, uh, I think I'm not going to be able to read this. Um, 
Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make big choices in life because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you're gonna die is the best way to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You're already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. I think we'll end on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Everybody.